The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the one holy and living God. Amen. Well, we've arrived after all these weeks of the 15 stories that Reverend Jim and Reverend Elizabeth have touched on in which Jesus is doggedly trying to get his disciples to understand who he truly is and the disciples just don't get it time and time again, here we are at the final one, the healing of blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus, who sits on the roadside, hears that Jesus of Nazareth is coming, and cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. People try to shut him up, of course. Show a little respect, they might have said. He isn't here for you they might have hissed at him. But Bartimaeus, with nothing left to lose, cries out all the more, have mercy on me. And Jesus, at this cry, stops in his tracks. You can imagine the scene a little bit, right? Dusty, dirty, people everywhere pressing in on him as he walks. They're all talking, they're trying to get his attention, to garner his favor, even to just figure him out. And through the din, there comes this cry, have mercy on me. And it stops him. You can imagine that in the stopping, uh, there's like this cartoon-esque piling up of people that occurs. And hopefully they stopped talking too, so they could hear him when he finally said, call him here. The disciples, too, had heard Bartimaeus and were likely amongst those who were shushing him up. But they'd been around long enough to know that when he spoke, they obeyed, even if it didn't make sense to them. Take heart, they said. Get up, he's calling you. So Bartimaeus doesn't just get up, he sprang up and came to Jesus, pushing his way through all those people, trapped in the darkness of his sightlessness, the crowds part slightly to make a path for him, and there he is, finally in front of Jesus. It's in this moment that we could all imagine that Jesus would say in some form or another, so you want to see again, do you? Do you want your blindness cured? Jesus knows what Bartimaeus is suffering from. 
but he doesn't jump to conclusions. Instead, he asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Let me see again, my teacher. My teacher, let me see again. And Jesus heals him. His faith has made him well. And what does Bartimaeus do? He follows Jesus on the way. Last week, Reverend Elizabeth preached a glorious sermon in which she referenced the new Mr. Rogers documentary that's come out recently. I confess to you, I haven't seen it, but it's for the weird reason that I know I'll love it too much. <laughs> Everyone I know who's posted about it online has talked about how it just elicited all of these uh, tears. And if you know me at all, you know I am a crier, a big time crier so I would probably need a week off to recover from this beautiful movie. <laughs> so I have not seen it, but I was so compelled by this component that Reverend Elizabeth mentioned that from this commencement address that Mr. Rogers gave. Mr. Rogers said that we all have people in our lives who we should remember who have loved us into loving, that by their words, deeds, actions, they have taught us what it is to love and to be loved. And as that sermon stayed with me this past week, I found myself contemplating the converse of this statement, too. In the same way that we can be loved into loving, I think we likely know that we can be hurt into hurting, too. That through words, deeds, and actions, we have known deep hurt and we have perpetrated deep hurt on others. The range of this is vast, of course, because none of us is immune. Whether it's a careless word to our spouse or a coworker, whether it's an overinflated sense of importance at the expense of others, whether it's deciding we know better than someone else how to live their lives for them, or whether like yesterday, it's the violent atrociousness of walking into a synagogue and killing 11 people who are at prayer. We have been hurt into hurting people. Personally, systemically, spiritually, we can all cite a time when we have been hurt. While it's much harder to face, we can likely all cite a time when we have done the hurting too. Personally, systemically, and spiritually, Bartimaeus was hurt, shunned and made a beggar because of his blindness. The systems of the day declare that it was likely something he brought upon himself, so he became a nothing in society's eyes. And the religious folks of the day, in spite of following God, they too felt justified in following society's mandates to reject this person. He must have offended God, and that is why he is blind. The miracle is that somehow in the midst of that, or in spite of that, Bartimaeus had just enough left in him to cry out to Jesus, have mercy on me. The courage in the midst of that hostile, uncaring crowd to cry out to Jesus. Thanks be to God for that courage. On Friday, I heard another powerful sermon, this one delivered at our Washington National Cathedral by the Right Reverend Jean Robinson at the service of interment of Matthew Shepard. You might find it hard to believe it has been 20 years since this young man, only 21 years old at the time, was beat to death in the middle of a Wyoming field for being gay. 20 years. He was tied to a fence post and the life beat out of him. After his funeral happened, his parents kept his ashes at home because they did not trust that Matthew's grave would not be defaced because of the hostility that was towards him. Matthew had been an active Episcopalian at his home church. And so in preparation for the 20 year anniversary of his death, a conversation was begun about the possibility of laying him finally to rest at our Washington National Cathedral, which then became reality. 
As of Friday, he now rests alongside the likes of Woodrow Wilson, Helen Keller, Annie Sullivan, and more. Bishop Robinson recalled, after about five years later, he received a note of encouragement from Matthew's mother on the day of his consecration as our church's first openly gay bishop. It was handed to him, he said, as he strapped on a bulletproof vest that he had to wear for his consecration because there had been so many death threats against him for undertaking this leadership role. Courage again. It was an emotional sermon for both the bishop and for those listening. Anyone who sat there who had ever been hurt for being different felt the palpable energy of remembering those moments of hurt, grieving those moments that had happened to them, and that there was somehow now some small bit of peace for this young man, who we know was crying out for mercy in that Wyoming field. There was a little bit of hope in the midst of all of that grief. And so the hard question is laid before us. Who is crying out for mercy now in our lives, in our world? Who are we shushing? Who are we telling to keep quiet? We all do it. None of us are immune. We do it out of fear. Maybe fear that we won't be heard crying out if someone else is being heard. Maybe it's fear that our pain is so great that to divert attention from our own needs and wants puts us at risk of not getting the relief that we so desperately need. And even though we know, we know that Jesus has enough mercy and love for each and every one of us, we still fear. And so our cry to Jesus is still, have mercy on me. It must always be, have mercy on me. But it should also be more. Have mercy on me, for I have not shown mercy. Have mercy on me, show me how to have mercy for others. Have mercy on me, because I don't know yet how to have mercy even for myself let alone others. And Jesus will say, will always say, what do you want me to do for you? Let me see again, we will say. Let me see again. I have been hurt into hurting, and I don't want to anymore. Let me see again that I can love even those I don't understand, even those I fear. Let me see that there is room enough to be afraid, but brave too. Brave enough to believe that your love is for every single person and that there is plenty enough to go around. Let me see that I can share that love, that I can lay down my hurts and try a new way. Let me see that when I do, it will take time it doesn't happen overnight to learn a new way. Let me see that, that you will never leave me as I try and fail and try again. At the end of his sermon, Bishop Robinson finally addressed Matthew himself. Gently rest in this place, he said. You are safe now. Welcome home. Can we be the place where those who have been hurt are finally safe now? Can we not let our own stuff get in the way and just be a people of mercy? We all want to do and be our best when it comes to practicing our faith. That can be hard and confusing when we have strong beliefs about what the scripture is saying into our lives. But time and again, scripture comes back 
to love and mercy. So what if we just always followed those ways? What if in the midst of it all, and even with so much we don't understand and are trying to understand and think we understand, what if we just decided our default is going to be love and mercy, period? That's it. Could we trust that this is indeed faithfulness? It starts with crying out, though. It starts with each of us acknowledging our own need for mercy. Our need for mercy from a God who cannot stop loving us and will not stop loving even those we don't love very much ourselves. There is a beautiful new peace for Matthew Shepard in this new earthly resting place. But there are many who know no peace in today's world. What can you do to show mercy for them? Listen. They are crying out to us. We are called to stop in our tracks and listen, to hear them, to find out what it is they need and want, and to show them mercy. Part of how Jesus shows mercy is through us. So we have a responsibility to enact this faith we profess, even though it'll be hard. So come here. Come here. Get strengthened. Get nurtured and loved at this table of grace. Feel Christ's mercy for you. And then go give it to this world. Go. Go.